you remember all those silly things that our parents told us to do and not to do? Turn off the lights when you leave the room. Don't run with scissors. Look both ways before you cross the street. Don't talk to strangers. Say please and thank you. Don't leave your clothes on the floor. Brush your teeth and floss. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. If you lose, use the last piece of toilet paper, put a new roll on the holder. Um, clean up your room. Don't talk with your mouth full and don't pee in the closet. Now, what? what your, your parents didn't have to tell you to do that? Oh, well, um, why did our parents... Why did our parents pound all of those rules into our heads and sometimes into our bottoms? Because they knew what we do or don't do affects our health and our safety. It influences whether people want to be around us or not, and it determines whether or not we live long enough to pound those same rules into our own children. Wise parents know that every action or inaction can make a difference. Whether our children understand it or not, whether they believe it or not, whether they agree with it or not, and that's why wise parents make a big deal about what their kids do and how they behave and don't let them get away with merely talking about what needs to happen as I used to do. See, when I was a kid, I drove my mom nuts because I was always fixing to do whatever she said. Now, if you're from the South, you know what that means. But she would say, have you taken out the garbage? I'm fixing to. Did you start your homework? I'm fixing to. Did you make up your bed? I'm fixing to. See, I knew as long as I was fixing to, I didn't have to do. But she knew that as well, unfortunately. And every once in a while, when I said I was fixing to, she would fix me. That taught me a valuable lesson. Talking seldom takes the place of doing. My mother didn't want me to talk about what she wanted me to do. She didn't want me to agree with her about what she told me to do. She didn't want me to think about what she told me to do. She wanted me to do it. God is a whole lot like my mother. He doesn't want us merely to talk about what He wants us to do or merely agree with Him or only think about it. He wants us to do it. Action is what counts. Not thinking, not talking, not agreeing not even believing. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't God want us to believe? Doesn't He want us to believe that He loves us, that He died on the cross for us, that He rose again? Doesn't He, doesn't he want us to believe this stuff? Yes, God wants us to believe this stuff. But belief is only the beginning. Belief is the beginning of our relationship with God. It's the starting line of the race that God lays out for us to run over the course of our life. Faith starts with belief, but faith is not merely just belief. The Bible defines faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It's choosing to trust that what we hope for is actually true, even though we can't see it. It's being so sure of what we hope for and so certain of what we do not yet see that we act like it's really true and do something about what we believe. Because if we merely believe but don't do anything about it, don't act like it's really true, then we're doing to God what I did to my mother. I'm fixing to. God, I'm fixing to love you. I'm fixing to do what you say to do. I'm fixing to love my neighbor as myself. I'm fixing to love the Messiah family the way that you love me. And fixing to doesn't cut it. Fixing to ain't faith. And neither is merely believing. James says that today as he writes, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if people claim to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothing and daily food. One of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith is not just believing, it's also doing. It's not just agreeing with God, faith is action based on what we believe. 
God wants us to believe, to believe He loves us, to believe He forgives us, to believe He heals us, to believe that He knows what's best for us. But even more than that, He wants us to act like we believe it because it's how we act that shows whether our faith is alive or dead. It's what we do or don't do that demonstrates our faith or lack thereof. Now, children understand this. They catch on quickly to what to believe or not, and they catch on not by what their parents say, but by what their parents do. If we parents say that God is a priority in our life, but our children never catch us praying or reading our Bibles, if they don't hear us talk about what God has done or see us do anything identifiably Christian, they quickly conclude that God's really not that important. If we tell our kids not to be selfish, but they don't see us serving our neighbors and sacrificing our own convenience to love our neighbors as ourselves, they pick up that the real priority is taken care of number one. If we tell our kids that being part of a church family enriches their lives, but we don't bring them here with us regularly and participate actively when we get here, they understandably perceive that there are better things to do on Sundays and better folks to spend them with. And it's not just our children who can tell what we believe or not by what we do. God does. If we really believe this stuff, and I pray we do, I do, if we really believe this stuff, let's act on it. Let's act like it. Let's love God with our whole heart, mind, and strength and show it by how we act, not just here in public when we're together, but also at home and in private. Let's love our neighbors as ourselves and lay aside our own comfort and convenience to help people in need and treat them like we want to be treated. Let's love one another as Jesus loves us and listen to people when they're down and encourage them and help them when they're having a bad time and pray for them, especially if they're sad or sick. And if you're not quite sure how to do that or whom to help or where to start, have I got a gift for you. On the website homepage is a button and out in the narthex today is a table labeled the Messiah's Way. Now, some of us suspect the Messiah's way is just the church sticking another straw in our milkshake to <laughs> suck out some time and money after whatever's left over from our scratching out a, li a living, and that's not what it is. Some of us think the Messiah's way is just filling out slots in the church organizational chart. It's not. The Messiah's way is an opportunity for each of us to do our faith and live our love. It's a chance to act on what we believe and practice what we pray. It's 30-something practical, easy to understand, simple to do ways to love God and our neighbors and each other by volunteering our time and our talent and our treasure. Now, whether you're a child or a teenager or an adult, there's something in the Messiah's way that you can do, whether it's being up here in front or if it's behind the scenes invisible. Whether it's cooking or cleaning or building or weeding or trimming or singing or playing music or fixing broken stuff, whether it's being with people or being by yourself, whether it's loving babies or children or teenagers or adults or older people, and whether it's serving somewhere on this campus or somewhere out in the community or in the world, the Messiah's Way offers each of us chances to do whatever we're good at and whatever we like, and to do it for God and for our neighbors and for each other. So please go to the website, click on that button, or visit the table out in the narthex today to see the opportunities to put your faith into action. Watch the digital ministry fair that's on the website. It was showing before the service. It's going to show again here at the end. Look over the who you're going to call list. It's got phone numbers and email addresses of the leaders of each of the ministries so you can contact them, ask them any questions, and then pray and ask God what He'd like you to do. Not just think, not talk about, not believe, not fix into, but asking God what He wants you to do in the next year to live your faith, hope, and love. Now, if you've never asked God that kind of question before, how are you going to know when he answers? Well, it's probably not going to be a burning bush or a flash of lightning. 
It probably will be you're looking over the stuff in the digital ministry fair or the list of things, the options, and you're going to think, oh, that looks cool. I think I'd like that. That's the Holy Spirit bubbling up inside of you and telling you, I got a treat for you. Now, this may be news for some of us who think it doesn't count as faith unless we hate it, or that anything we like must be sinful, selfish, or fattening. Some of us are sure that if God were to ask us to do something, it would be to go someplace we don't want to go, to do things we don't want to do with people that we don't like. That's why some of us don't ask God those kinds of questions, because we secretly suspect He wants to ruin our life. Now, that's just silly. God loves us. He made each of us for a purpose, and finding and fulfilling that purpose is an adventure and not a drag. Now, God will change and stretch us, but when God calls, it's never boring and it's not drudgery. There will be a sense of awe and wonder and excitement as we do it. So let's each of us ask God, what do you want me to do in this next year? Now, for some of us, this may be the first time we've ever asked that kind of question and the first time we ever hear an answer, which is all the more reason to ask. So let's ask God, how much time would you like me to spend loving you and my neighbor and my fellow Christians? Let's ask Him which of our talents He wants us to offer to make a difference in this parish family and out in the world. And let's ask Him how much of our treasure He wants us to give to show our gratitude for all He's done for us. And then let's fill out our Messiah's Way commitment and make our promise to Him for the next year. And if you do that online and hit submit, it's done. If you do it on paper, bring your commitment sheet back next week or in two weeks for our parish birthday party. In October and November, we'll orient you to whatever you volunteer for. And on the last Sunday in November, which is the first Sunday at Advent, the first Sunday of our new church year, we all get to jump in and do what God wants us to do for the next year. Through the Messiah's way, let's act on our belief and live our love. Because that's not just fixing to, that's actual faith.